Hey, welcome to the show. I'm here today with Shari Smith. Shari, how are you this morning? Doing great, Travis. How are you? Uh, I'm doing fabulous as always. Shari runs Evaluation into Action, and she authored the book Nonprofit Program Evaluation Made Simple. I got to read ahead of this book. I really appreciate that. It's it lines up with three principles that I always always love. Is that was readable, relatable, and actionable. It actually makes sense. You actually have real world examples in there. It's easy to understand. I really appreciate it about you. Thanks so much. Tell us a little bit about evaluation into action and the book you wrote as a result. You bet. So I founded evaluation into action back in 2005. It was really an exciting time for me to get into really helping nonprofit organizations and foundations understand how to build realistic and meaningful evaluation systems. Now, I say realistic first, and you said that relatable, right? Um, I, I say that first because it's really important that your system be realistic so that it actually gets implemented and then actions can be taken based on the data because too often it, it doesn't, right? It's not realistic and then people stall and they get frustrated and they stop doing it. So I really wanted to make program evaluation accessible. I'm really passionate about helping people understand how to use data, why to gather the data to really help their organizations thrive. And the book, <laughs> this is a little bit of a fun story. So the book, um, I do a lot of workshops, right? I, I do workshops at uh, different conferences. I've been a keynote speaker. I've been, you know, really fortunate to be able to share uh, my excitement and knowledge with other people. After each workshop or any sessions, I generally get people approach me and say, hey, I love what you said. Do you have a book? And the answer is always, no, that's a lot of work to write a book. <laughs> So no, work. thank you. So much work. So much work. My family likes to see me sometimes. So I, um, by 2017, I you was presenting with your husband and then you started. I did. He was like, yeah. I don't know about this. Sorry. <laughs> um, but in 2017, I presented at open, which is the Oregon program evaluators network here in Portland, Oregon. And at that conference, I did a session on building a culture of evaluation, which is something I'm extremely passionate about. And so uh, again, I got the question, hey, afterwards, do you have a book? And I thought, oh my goodness. And I had co-presented with one of my clients and she looked at me and she's like, Shari, you know, you should just write your process down and, and put it in a book. And I'm like, oh my goodness. So um, I kind of noodled on it and I don't know what was different that time, but there was kind of like that, you know, that intuitive gut that you get, mm -hmm. that little nudge from wherever, like, yes, you should write the book. So I chained myself to my computer, <laughs> took, took a couple of weekend writing retreats, you know, at different places and, and got that book out. And I'm really excited about it. You know, pretty much every day, I, I'm very fortunate that I receive, you know, thanks, or I like your book, or I could read it. And now I understand how to get started. Um, which makes it all worth it. And I'm able to share that with my family. And I'm like, look, we are helping people. Yay. We're getting people excited about using data. And so, and that was the point to really demystify it, to make it accessible. You know, the book isn't intended to make anybody into a professional program evaluator, right? But it is intended to break it down into something realistic and manageable that people can implement right away. Oh yeah, data. Talk nerdy to me. What's up? Uh, for those of you just listening and not seeing the video here, Shari actually has chains in the background that she used to chain herself <laughs> to the computer. That's legit. Uh, don't check the video and see that I'm full of it. But it, you know, what's crazy is that they ask you about a book. I, I've been getting the same questions, and I said, you know, when a hundred people ask me, I think that I really need the book. Well, now 200 people have asked me and I still haven't written the one they've been asking for. Travis, maybe it's time. It, it might be time. Uh, part of my story is available in Walk With Warriors. Uh, Shannon Whittington put together an anthology of, of veteran authors sharing their stories. So a little sliver of my stories in there. I wrote like a how to buy cars guide years ago that has like one star reviews on Amazon. So it's really crummy. But then I, <laughs> I wrote a, a ultimate podcast guide, which has done very well. And we're turning that into a course because as soon as I wrote that, people were like, where's the course? 
Whereas of course, right. I want you to walk me, hold my hand, walk me through this thing. So that's being built right now. And if this thing comes out in January, like I think it does, the course will be live and you can take it at Forbes Business School and get college credit with the University of Arizona, which is just mind blowing for me. That's not something I ever thought I'd be a part of. That's but, exciting. Yeah, absolutely. But the evaluation thing, get back to your like super expertise here. This is something we do in the military with every single thing that we do. I've been in aviation my whole military career from a mechanic to then flying the airplanes. Um, and every program gets evaluated. Every process and procedure gets evaluated. You get evaluated as an individual. So there's always someone kind of double checking to make sure you're a following an instruction that you're doing, you're meeting the intent of the instruction and then actually measuring the results and how well is that working? If it's not working, you have to, we call it a just fire. You guys would probably call it like, I don't know, pivot or flex. I, to call, something. A lear- I call it a learning opportunity. Yeah. Just a learning opportunity. Yeah. But like, do you find that a lot of organizations, like you say, like program evaluation and they like cringe in their face? Oh, changes. yeah. Oh, wait till you say like logic model. It's all over. People are just like, they dissolve and like, I'm out. But, um, and oftentimes it's because they've had a bad experience with a logic model in the past. What I often see is logic models that they already have in place are not being used, but they spent a lot of time developing them. And that's where the resentment comes in, right? That like, we spent all this time doing this logic model and we're doing nothing with it. Like it doesn't mean anything. Whereas the approach that I use is if we're going to create something, it's going to be created with the concept in mind that you're going to use it. Mm-hmm. If you're not going to use it, we're not going to create it. So you, we were talking a little bit about before the show about like different types of evaluation I understand you evaluate programs specifically, not like That's how'd right. your fundraiser do, not how's your engagement with your donors, actual programs. Like what is program evaluation? So program evaluation is a systematic process to understand what's working in your nonprofit program and what's not working. And at its core, it's a learning opportunity. So if the point of your program is to promote housing stability, so you have a resident services program where you're going into all of these affordable housing units, right, to do different activities to promote housing stability. So then the program evaluation is set up to gather data to understand if what you're doing is in fact promoting housing stability, or if you have a program about reading, you know, about trying to improve reading skills for students that are struggling in that area, say, you know, grades K through three or something like that. Well, you can do reading assessments, of course, but what if you can go deeper and understand if the tutors, if the teachers, if the principals, if the students are all really understanding and taking to the format, the way you've set up the program. Is there an opportunity to make it an hour instead of a 30 minute session? Is there, so you have to gather data to understand what is working with the program. And then you can modify that program to really make sure you are in fact making the difference you intend to make. It's all about alignment to your mission, to your program goals. How do you know if you're actually achieving those program goals unless you're gathering data, Absolutely. Again, with the, the nerdy talk, I love it. What, so I would like to uh, talk about one theme and then try to apply all the different stuff we're going to talk about today to that one theme. Okay, uh, let's go. Me and, a, me and a friend of mine are looking into uh, stopping suicides and veterans and first responders and then what we would learn from that and how that can apply to other industries and other groups of people. Like, I don't know this answer. I don't know if there's programs out there that, I mean, there's tons of programs out there, but like, how do we evaluate whether or not those programs are having a measurable impact on the suicide rate? Like, how do we know that? Okay. There's a lot of competing thoughts in my head. So I'm going to start with the first one that popped up first, that gets the first take. When you talk about this, the first thing I like to do is a literature review. So a literature review looks at all the published studies, articles, anything out there focused on one question. And that one question would be, I mean, Travis, you kind of just said it, right? Like, how do we stop suicides with this population? And what is the impact of these suicide prevention programs on the actual suicide rate? Mm -hmm. 
My guess is that studies have already been done through different universities and whatnot on that particular subject. So I do literature reviews all the time for my clients. So if you're listening and you're like, oh my God, literature review, great idea. You can call me. But what I love about literature reviews is they save so much time. So if you're starting a program or you're not sure if you have your program is the best it can be, you know, aside from the evaluation part, just the program itself, you can do a literature review on what similar programs are already out there with a similar goal or outcomes that you're trying to achieve. So in this case, the literature review would focus on suicide prevention programs and any studies that exist on how they are evaluating those programs and then how those are connected to um, impacting the suicide rate. So a literature review will get you a step ahead of gathering all of that knowledge into one place. And then, you know, you really have a place to start on the canvas, right? You don't have a blank canvas and your paint palette, right? You have like, there's already paint on the canvas. You already know where, what direction you're going to go in. So um, that's where I would start literature review. That's why I like color by numbers. Cause I know exactly what I got to put in there. <laughs> I do. I do too. Yeah. Yeah. I know they have like those paint and cheers and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, they walk you through it, but like color by number, just me, my own thoughts. And if I can match the color to the number, I'm good. Right. Um, so we are doing it like an extensive literature review. My partner is no kidding, getting into studies, national good. military, our mental health Institute, looking at the RAND foundation, seeing what the VA has put out, what those look like. So I think we're like in a good starting place. But really understanding, you know, who's doing what programs and like there's something like 53,000 veteran organizations out there, which is just an absurd astronomical number. Um, you know, they all have some type of program, but I don't imagine they're all evaluating. I mean, you've mm -hmm. seen this before, you know, some are, some are not. How do you really build if you, if you need them to get you the numbers? but they're not looking at doing it and they haven't thought about doing it. Like, how do you go in and really build a culture of evaluation? That is a great question. And that was a big reason I wrote the book because I felt like there are a lot of organizations who just don't know how to get started or they want to do it because it's mandated by their funders. So it's not that they want to do it because they want to learn what's working and what's not. They want, they have, they feel like they have to do it. How many of us love doing things that we have to do, right? So um, there are so many different things that feed into building a culture of evaluation, right? Oh, I was answering your question. Love doing things I'm mandated to do. Oh, okay. Sorry, you guys can't see this, but he just put his thumb up. I'm like, thumb up. Like, what does that mean? What are we right doing? When she asked the question, I put the thumb up with a big smile. And then she looked away into like the ether to see you. Oh, answer. I get very excited yeah. about it all. Yes. Oh, yes. Obviously, so, absolutely. <laughs> so building a culture of evaluation is starts with a really honest conversation among staff about doing evaluation work and the motivation behind doing it. If the motivation is we feel mandated, right? So it's a culture of compliance. And really there's questions like, do we have to do it? I don't have the time. It's really expensive. Don't funders know we're already making a difference? And why do we have to prove it, right? So that keeps people in these beliefs like stuck that it takes too much time, it takes too much money. And it's really blocking them from that learning opportunity. Typically that culture of compliance if you go deeper, it really comes down to some sort of fear that they'll learn it's maybe something's not working. There's a fear around job security, fear of losing funding. I'm not saying this is true for everybody, but there's some people out there I'm probably hitting a nerve going, oh God, she's right. I didn't realize that. Ooh. So, I mean, you know, right, right? like that, yeah. that fear, yeah. that fear. But what you want to do is look at shifting people to a culture of learning where the questions are more like, will this survey help us learn if we are in fact making the impact we intend to be making? And can we use the data to inform our program planning practices so we can make a more efficient use of our time in implementing the program? So we're not guessing at what we should be doing. We know what we should be doing because the data are telling us what's working and what's not. So then the belief system is rooted in data are needed for continuous program improvement, period. We really want to understand we are committed to re reaching our program goals, to fulfilling our mission, 
And we're going to use data in order to make sure we are on the path to accomplish that. So that's really like, I'm on like both sides of the spectrum there, right? The culture of compliance and the culture of learning. Most organizations fall somewhere in between, right? Of like, they're not completely one way or the other, or maybe they have a couple of people one way or the other. But the way to make the shift is to have that open conversation and kind of describe what I just described, right? And have that conversation of like, why aren't we doing this? Or why are we doing it this way? You know, why are we feeling mandated? How can we be doing it better so that we're learning? So it's really coming from a place of learning, a place of curiosity, rather than a place of fear. See, I'm a huge fan of being wrong as many times as possible in a day. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say it, I say it that way on purpose, because you're like, what? Why would you want to be wrong all day? Because that's the only chance if I, I put it out there confidently, like this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm doing it this way. This is why I feel this way. That's the only chance someone else can say like, oh, that's interesting. I kind of do it this way. Oh, then I get the chance to say, if you're doing it different than, than I'm doing it, you must know something that I don't know. So I want to learn what it is that I don't know to figure out how I can adjust to figure out how to do it better because that's the only way I find out how to do it better. And I don't know if people are just, they're either in it to learn or they want to be right. And if they feel like they need to be right, it's almost like they're closed off to learning. You know, when I look at the biz, business sector and the military, evaluation is there all the time. Businesses don't want to waste money. So, right. and they want to make the most money possible. So they that's do all right. these things like A and B testing in their marketing because if they put something out there and one far outperforms the other one, well, they're going to stop doing the one that's not making them money. You got it. You, you yeah. hit it right on the head, right? That's exactly right. So it, that's how program evaluation translates. We need to gather the data to know if A or B, like what's working and what's not working so we can improve. I think the difference in the nonprofit sector, right, is that the funding comes from various sources, right? We rely on individual donors, foundations and whatnot, all these different sources. So there's this power dynamic where they want to make sure that they are getting, looking, putting their best foot forward. They're a straight A student so that the funders, right? are like straight A student, you get the money. That's not exactly how it works though. I've worked with a number of funders as well. And they also say to me like, how, how do we partner? How do we like level this and, and get rid of this power dynamic? Cause we wanna partner and make sure we are learning what's working and what's not working. Well, here's one place to start. So all of you funders that are listening, take a look at your funder report that you're requiring nonprofits to complete. If you have something in there around uh, tell us how you evaluated your program and what worked and what didn't. Add a statement in there, giving them permission to show where they failed and where they can improve. Add something in there saying, hey, we are really committed to partnering with you. If you found something wasn't working, please share those data and share your improvement plan. That is the key. That is where people get stuck. I don't wanna show anything negative to our funder. But if you show that negative thing to your funder with, this is how we're gonna improve it, and then we're gonna measure again, that shows you're willing to fail, learn, try again, grow and thrive, right? I, I, I'm I, not gonna guarantee it, but I've never seen a funder say, no, we're not giving them money if they failed. I'm not gonna, you know, don't call me and say, Shari said, you know, <laughs> but that has been my experience. My experience has been funders, want to know what's not working because that's call, how we call learn. And say, Shari said, please, please do that. Uh, <laughs> I've always been a, a fairly open person. I've made tons of mistakes in my life. I found out the fastest way to resolution is to walk into the boss's office and say, Hey, this is what happened. This is what I did wrong. And here's my plan to fix it. That's right. Is the quickest way out of any problem. Uh, mm -hmm. We, I hosted the veteran podcast awards last night and this is coming out months after we're recording it so it's no congratulations uh, thanks a lot it was a lot of fun <laughs> it was uh, october 5th the evening of and it was the first annual veteran podcast awards we had the site set up and the stuff it was it was really interesting a lot of fun but we had hey sign up here to register your podcast to be part of the show and sign mm -hmm. up here to get emails and what happened is that some of our partners signed up to, just to receive emails and not to register their show to be eligible to win an award. And we made the decision 
that because uh, there was a handful of shows that that chose the wrong option. I don't know if it wasn't clear on my part. I'm sure you know both sides have some kind of culpability in this thing, but um, so we made a mistake, right? We didn't have all the people that wanted to be part of the show weren't registered for the show, and I got you know some angry emails. So when I did the podcast awards last night, you know we talked about how we set it up, who was in charge, who was doing the stuff, some of our sponsors, and I said, hey, right up front, we gotta we gotta make an apology because it wasn't clear on the registration process. We have a lot of good shows that weren't included this year that we hope will be included next year. We'll make sure that process is smoothed out. But I said that right before we started the show. And I had a couple of people message me right up front, like, you know what? I really appreciate the the transparency because here's the deal. I mess up every day. Every day I mess some stuff up. I do it all the time. It's almost like I like doing it, (laughs) but I'm not going to, I'm not going to let the potential for a screw up prevent me from trying something. And trying right. something out and seeing how it goes, because that's the only way we really truly learn something is how do we get from knowledge and theory into experience. And the only way to do that is to try something. That's and so right. many nonprofits are not willing to try the whatever thing because they feel like they have to have straight A's all the time. Mm-hmm. As soon as you are upfront and clear about, you know what, we really had this great plan. We tried it out and it fell flat. I, <laughs> I that's right. bringing up some more stuff about, about me here. I got to the opportunity to host Miss Oklahoma pageant, one of the local like feeder pageants and wow. had to pronounce some names and had to do stuff. And there was a, a point in there where the setup was taking a little bit longer. I was like, you know what? I'm going to throw out a joke. It was terrible. It fell, fell flat. flat. <laughs> oh, no. It, it, no one, no one chuckled for like 10 seconds. I forget sometimes that you know, being uh, in the military and talking with veterans, like service animals are a huge topic of conversation. So I had this terrible joke that talked about, you know, no food or drink allowed in the auditorium. And I got caught with food and I'm like, but it's, but it's my service taco. Like I can have this in here. It's, it's, it's approved. Not the right crowd for that. Had I said maybe like, but it's my emotional support taco that might've went over well, but largely the audience wasn't familiar with service animals and what right. that's like in the special rules. So completely fell flat, but I don't feel bad about trying it because A, I'm not going to see most of those people ever again. B, <laughs> right. I know, right? And it, it distracted the audience from like what was going on behind the curtain. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Uh, but that's going to happen. It's going to mm-hmm. happen where we try a, a bad or a corny joke or we try to do some kind of campaign and it doesn't work out. That doesn't mean I didn't do a great job hosting. That doesn't mean they're not going to ask me back. All it means is that I'm human, just like all of you, and I fail. Right. So that's no big deal. Right, right. I'm, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that that is kind of the belief, the attitude for nonprofits to adopt regarding their programs and program evaluation, you know, and, and really being willing to be accountable, be transparent, and take ownership and learn, you know, learn from it. I think when you're going through this, you really have to define what those measurable things are. Why, why is it important to define the measurable outcome? Well, to me, the measurable outcome is the cornerstone of what drives the content of all data collection tools. So let me break that down. First, a measurable outcome is a change statement, right? It's going to start with some sort of verb, improve, increase, decrease, reduce, and so on. So what do you expect to have? change, right? So let's bring back the program you were talking about before, right? The suicide prevention program. So a measurable outcome is probably going to be is to reduce the number of suicides that occur, you know, maybe within a particular amount of time, right? That that's what you're trying to do. One of the things, right? It's an action statement, right? Because then that gives you direction of what exactly to measure. So when you're doing your surveys, when you're doing focus groups, what, whatever you do, I'm not saying you have to do surveys and focus groups, but whatever methodologies you choose to gather the data, are, you are in fact measuring to what degree you have achieved movement or change in those measurable outcome statements. And the key is to create them collaboratively because too often, I mean, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too, but too often grant writers write them in silo because the grant proposals ask something along the lines of what are your outcomes or what do you expect to have change or well, how will you measure success or you know all the those kind that kind of language and so they put really compelling lofty not always but you know it's their job to secure the funds mm-hmm. so they're going to put things in there that will help secure the funds 
What I learned early in my career is that what's written in the grant proposal isn't always what program staff are gathering data around. They may have no idea what's in the grant proposal. So then when it comes time to write the funder report, there's like this scramble and writing at like 2 a.m. in the morning to find data because nobody, there wasn't the communication. Mm -hmm. So when we talked earlier about building a culture of evaluation, this is one of the easiest fixes ever, right? Collaborate. So write those measurable outcomes with program and development staff at minimum. Ideally, you also have your executive director and other people in the room, but something where everybody organization-wide is aware of what those outcome statements are. So marketing and communications can use the data, fundraising staff can use the data, program staff know what kinds of data they need to be gathering so that they can report those out to, the, to everybody in the organization. That just alleviates so much of the stress of funders requiring the data. But more than that, the clients that I work with come to realize, oh, we're in the driver's seat. We're, we need to use the data. Yeah, we need to report it to the funders too. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we're in the driver's seat now. I had that experience um, with Northwest Housing Alternatives. They are one of the four organizations included in my book, Know What You Talk, Nonprofit Program Evaluation Made Simple. And when she told me after the fact, like way down the road, she said, the reason we brought you in was really to increase our grant funding. That's what we were excited about doing. And they did increase their grant funding. It went from about 50,000 a year to 300 to 400,000 a year because they could clearly show the impact that they were making, right? Mm -hmm. But what they really gained was getting data on an ongoing basis to really streamline and make their operations much more efficient in how they were implementing the program. They were no longer guessing at what to do when they went into the affordable housing units. They knew because they had the data, they were gathering data on a regular basis. That's the game changer. You know, it's a lot easier to paint a clearer picture when everyone's painting on the same canvas. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Collaboration. Like people hear me say that all the time. You have to collaborate. <laughs> it, it, it's interesting that uh, nonprofits are still working on getting their programs together. Like, I don't know, like I, I'm hosting this podcast, right? How do I know I'm doing a good job? You know, I have some things out there, like I have a group where you can interact with me on Facebook and I've got some social media accounts where I get some feedback and you've got like ratings and reviews. And if I didn't solicit for that kind of feedback, how would I know whether I am or not doing a good job? Like, oh, well, you can download numbers. Well, I don't know how many of those are recurring people or how many of them are new people. Or they and that just tells in. you numbers. Yeah. It just gives me a number. It doesn't, you know, give me a whole lot of information. I need that interaction and that feedback. Like uh, mm -hmm. early on in the show, my wife is wonderful. She didn't understand most of what I was talking about because she's not in that world, but she gave me some quality feedback. Apparently, I said, right, a lot at the end of the statement. I would say something. I'd be like, right? And she was like, you know, you say this all the time. And as a <laughs> listener, you're saying that like I should understand. And it really, because I don't know. It kind of made you feel like you were kind of jabbing at me. And I was like, huh, I didn't realize the things that I were saying were having that kind of that you're landing that way with you because I didn't understand. I used it kind of as a filler word, but she took offense to it because she didn't understand what I was saying. So mm -hmm. thanks to that feedback, I was able to adjust what I was doing and make my show a little bit more inclusive and help me get rid of some of them filler words to help me make a better show overall. So that feedback was valuable to me in order to get to make a better show and what I was doing, but I wouldn't have known to do that and adjust what I was doing if I didn't get that kind of feedback. Right, right. The feedback is really critical. And you touched on something else too, when you were talking about the numbers, um, there are two terms that I think are often confused, outputs and outcomes, right? So the outputs are just the numbers, just the bean counting. So in your case, it's the number of downloads, right? But it doesn't tell you anything about how people liked it or what they thought of it, or if there's anywhere that you can improve in it, right? So that's where outcomes help you understand the quality piece, whereas outputs help you understand the numbers of participation. You have to have both. I'm not saying like don't track your outputs, but outputs don't tell you if you're making a difference. They just tell you how many people are participating, right? Mm -hmm. Historically, like, I don't know, maybe two decades ago now, maybe more than that, 
it used to be what was asked for for evaluation was were just the outputs. How many people participated? How many food boxes were delivered? Those kinds of questions. And that sufficed. But that has changed radically to now we're at a point where, and I think it's a good thing of not only do we want to know about participation, but we want to know about change. We want to know what difference, what impact your program has made. It, it's so that's really good. Uh, especially in the nonprofit, it's weird because if I, you just mentioned, you know, a number of food boxes delivered, right? If I deliver 300 this week, but I deliver 200 next week, is it because my programs are not doing well or are they receiving food from somewhere else? Or is there less people in the system? Just having that number doesn't really get, paint the whole picture of what's it's going not on. not the whole picture, right. And if you're collaborating with a, a bunch of different groups to help, for instance, the homeless population, and you've got housing, and you've got medical services, and you've got food services over here. Well, the collaboration might be doing so well that you're creating less homeless people, which means That's less right. people are using all the services. But it's really hard to tout the numbers of less people that need you, because that doesn't necessarily coordinate to dollars needed or dollars spent. So it's kind of that dichotomy between providing services and actually solving the problem. So right. those numbers don't necessarily correlate or translate That's to right. the overall picture. Yeah, they're just one part of the picture, like you said. They're not the whole picture. Oh, absolutely. So we've got this culture of evaluation. We've put some things in place. What are some of the impact or logic models that are created to help with this process? The logic models? Um, well, so a logic model is really a visual summary, right, of what your program does and the difference it's expected to make. And traditionally, it has, you know, inputs, outputs, activities, goals, outcomes, all on one page, right? And I think they're great. And sometimes they're required, um, particularly for federal grants. I actually do a variation of that. I do an impact model. And I take elements from the logic model that resonate with the organization. So um, in most cases, at, at minimum, it's your program goal, your program activities, and your program outcomes. So that you're seeing, here's what we're trying to do. Here's the big you know, North Star for our goal. Here's how we're going to get there with these activities. And here are the outcomes that we expect as a result of those activities. The other key piece is you know, creating it collaboratively. So it's not something I go and create in like a little vacuum by myself. I get lots of input from the organization I'm working with on from all staff members. Like, what do you think is going to change here? What have you been observing? What activities do you think are actually working towards achieving your goal? Uh, those kinds of questions help me understand and synthesize everybody's opinions into one spot so that then we all come together and talk about what I found and talk about where they're in agreement and where there's disagreement so that then collaboratively, yep, there's that word again, you're going to get so tired of it from me, but here it is. So we collaboratively <laughs> um, come together and determine what those final elements are going to be. The really fun part is it doesn't stop there, right? We don't just make it a dry, like black and white uh, table. I like to create it in the colors of the organization's brand or for it to reflect what the organization is doing. So in the case of an affordable housing program, that will be in the shape of a house you know, with the program goal statement in the roof and so on. If it's a STEM Connect program, which I've done with the organization In For All, it'll be a linear uh, equation. You know, this volunteers plus the teachers equal these student outcomes, right? So really having fun with, let's make sure it's reflective because then it can be used beyond the evaluation process. You know, the marketing, communication, and fundraising staff love these because it's something that they can use publicly in one page to really communicate about what the program does and the change it's expected to make. I, I like that a lot. And I want to jump back a little bit because you, you brought it up again that you're, you're not building this in a silo, in a, in a closet, you know, typing this up by yourself. You're working together. And when we do this in the military, we go like through the naval planning process. So I'm an operational level planner. Um, it, you have all these things you've got to do, right? We're going to do this for this reason. And what we call it, we call it, we say, 
this is the task and it's for this purpose. And there's mm -hmm. a little three letters that we use in between those two statements, IOT in order to. So like we set up this Zoom call in order to create mm -hmm. a product and an interview and something useful for the nonprofit community to help them do things better. So you have the thing that you're doing it in order to accomplish a piece of whatever mm -hmm. the thing is. And when you mm -hmm. have these written out as a task and a purpose, what are you doing it and what's the goal or the outcome or why are you doing it? It makes mm -hmm. it really easy to understand and coordinate with everyone across the organization. They understand that you're doing this thing in order to reach this mission or is this part of this picture. And if you don't have things written up in that way, people are going to forget why they're doing those things. That's uh, right. Very important piece to have in that, especially when you're talking about going across departments and getting the whole organization involved. That's right. I really like that task to purpose. It's, it's very much similar to like activities to outcomes. If you're doing these activities, what, for what purpose, like, what are you hoping to achieve these outcomes? Yep. And if you're not doing it to achieve a purpose, then why are you doing it? Why are you doing it? Yeah. Why don't do it. it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. Quick tangent. This happens all the time. And this is going to be really a good one for everyone here. When you're looking at what data you're collecting, like particularly in surveys, or if you do intake forms or registration forms, only ask for what you're going to use. So if at the end of the day, you're not going to use all the demographic data that you're asking for, for funders, for program planning, or for some other purpose, stop asking for it. Yeah, absolutely. There's no, it's no good to send out a 500 question survey when you're only going to use 10%. Oh, stop, of the stop right there. Don't ever send out a 500 question survey. Oh my Lord. Don't send that out. <laughs> Who's going to answer that? Nobody, nobody, nobody. I actually, I worked with an organization and they're fantastic. And they were working at the time at the national level with a university. Okay. So they they have a chapter and I was working directly with a chapter because at that national level, this university team were, they were requiring the volunteer coordinators to complete a, wait for it, 300 question survey. What do you think their response rate was? Like, um, like pretty close to, if not zero. Really low. And it was hard because they were putting a lot of pressure on all of the uh, state chapter directors to pressure the volunteers to complete it. And you know that that wasn't done collaboratively, right? Because if they had shared that survey with the state directors ahead of time for feedback, which would have been like the, the way to go to make it realistic, right? And actionable, they would have gotten that feedback of this is too long. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, so there's like science on this. If you ever gone to a website to like build a car, I go to Chevy.com, you pick this model and you want to pick out the paint and the interior. And oh yeah. Like For a minute, I thought you meant literally build a car. I'm like, Travis, that is not my wheelhouse, but, but yes, I can go to a website and build a car. Yeah. You know, you go in there and you dream a little bit, you build your fancy <laughs> yeah, yeah. car, you look at the price and you're like, eh, never doing this. Right. Right. But they found because over, over time and collecting data. Oh, one of those nerdy words is so awesome. I love it. That is too many questions to answer. Right. If you have a form and you pull it up and it says, pick the color, the interior style, the quality of the Match. engine, sunroof, all that, it's too many questions. So what they do is they specifically only ask you one or two or three questions per page. And they Good. start out with one or two and they build it as the pages go. They start giving you a few more options. So when you go to Chevy.com to build your ultimate dream Corvette or whatever you know car you're interested in, they start with what model or what style, and then you pick the model, and then you pick the color, and then you pick the interior, then you pick a performance package, which has three or four options, and then they start getting into other things, like, do you want mud flaps? Do you want a sunroof? Yeah. Do you want this? They stuff? start really basic mm -hmm. and get more complicated, and that's mm -hmm. how survey design works, too. There's a chapter in my book all about survey design. In fact, one thing I want to mention that's really fun about the book is there's a companion website Every book has a password to get into the companion website. And on that companion website are examples of the impact models, as well as a survey design template so that people can see how you start. You start 
simple with it, right? Like you were saying with the Chevy site that you just start with, what color do you want? So just like icebreaker, easy questions, warm people up. But, um, and then you get more complicated around the questions regarding impact as you get deeper into the survey. But always start with something easy for people to ease their way or warm up to answering the questions, but not 300 questions. <laughs> Yeah, that. 250 is my personal limit. No, no way. Limit. Not even that. Not even that. I'm telling you what, I look at like the equivalent of two pages total to me is the ideal. Don't do more than two pages total. And here's the other key. I know we, we're going on a tangent again. Um, just journey with me. It'll be fun. So when you finish your survey and you have your survey results, share back the highlights, the key findings with your entire group. Because how many times have you completed a survey for any reason at all? And you never know what happened with the results or where they fit in or how they use it. So to really strengthen the feedback loop and to really quite frankly, increase your response rate, if people know that you're paying attention and using it. So when they fill out the survey and like whatever it is a month later, they get in the email newsletter, thanks for completing the survey. Here are like four or five bulleted key findings here, are how we're gonna use the data. You know, we're gonna do it again. We're gonna do the survey again at blah, blah, blah date. We look forward to more feedback. Make such a difference in building a culture of evaluation and how you're using and learning from the data and communicating your findings. Okay. We, we do this. I'm, I'm off the tangent. I'm back. Can, can I have my soapbox back, please? Sure. Sorry. Here you go. I'm handing okay. it through the screen. Yeah, my my turn to soapbox it up. <laughs> I can. Hold, but, holding the talking stick. Yes. So <laughs> <laughs> Flashbacks. Do you have the talking stick? No, you do not. <laughs> Travis has the talking stick. <laughs> So, so mil military aviation does this. We have um, command climate surveys to see like how are people like doing like with each other and interacting with everyone in the command. And you go through and you answer a bunch of questions about safety and you feel like you belong and is the leadership engaging and all these different things. And the aviation safety officer, which I'm an aviation safety officer, puts this all together, gets everyone to do it. And they compile all the results and it goes off to an independent organization that puts the data all together. You see where you are. Just obviously, mm -hmm. there's going to be some outliers in different sections, but it's completely anonymous. Uh, and it's got to be anonymous in, in this situation. You do not want Absolutely. like, you know, some person called out so and so and they go to that person specifically to, you know, so no backlash. There can't be any backlash and this kind of stuff. But then they get to address concerns. And it's a great way, especially for leadership, to find out you know, kind of where their blind spots are, because there's going to be something that they're just not in their normal, you know, vision of duties and the normal people that they see in a day. Like there's going to be things from different areas that they, they didn't know what was going on. It always happens, but they really do a good job of getting like the command unit, you know, the commanding officer, executive officer, and usually the command master chief, the senior enlisted uh, personnel to come together and kind of, you know, dive through these, these details and these survey results to see what it does. You know, is there something the command needs to do more of or less of, do they need to do some extracurricular type things to get involved? Are they really paying attention? Are they getting out and being with the staff, you know, as people as much, and they really do a good job of using that to help kind of make sure, you know, it's kind of like a self kind of report card, like, like how am I doing? Am I putting my efforts in the right areas? Am I talking to the people? What am I missing? What am I has not been on my radar that really kind of needs to be on my radar? And how do I make sure I, I move forward with this stuff? But I really just think that the data is so important, but that's a big difference between like an internal report yep. and an external report. What are you that's sharing right. with your staff and what are you sharing with the, you know, the public at large? Like, how mm -hmm. do you know what to share or what not to share? And you know, what do those kind of reports look like? Yeah, that's a great question. That's why there's a, an entire chapter dedicated to reports in, in, the, uh, in my book, because I think it's really important to articulate that because once you have all of the data, it's like, okay, now what? <laughs> How do we synthesize it in a way that's meaningful and user-friendly? I generally do reporting at two levels. I do the internal technical report that has all the nitty gritty of whatever kinds of survey or what other data collection activities that we did, right? So we have it all compiled in one spot. 
tends to be a little bit of a longer report. I still put the visualizations in there because I think that's so important. You know, I think gone are the days of just text and tables through a whole evaluation report. We need, we need, <laughs> yeah. you guys can't see it, but Travis made this face like he just bit into a lemon. So yes, no lemon faces. We want it to be interesting to read, right? And, and then walk through it with everybody and talk about what we learned, how the data are going to be used, um, I generally have some recommendations uh, because at one time I was a program director many, many, many moons ago. So I understand like, how do you then translate this to actually what should we change in our program as a result of what we learned, right? So all of that's articulated. Um, ideally then that is the key points are shared with your board, right? And you talk about it as a staff. Then externally, I like to create a two page um, impact summary report. And this really goes to town with the graphics and the visualizations and really highlights the key pieces that you want to share with the community at large. And sometimes that may include, hey, here's something we learned that wasn't working and here's how we're going to address it. And it really helps with that transparency and accountability piece um, to really put it out there. And I, you know, this is talked about in my book, but also if you jump over to my website, evaluationintoaction.com, and you go to the portfolio page, you can look at, you know, a sample of these types of reports for free and take a look at what I'm talking about. But I think it's really important to work Here's the word again, collaboratively, right? <laughs> this is going to become a game. Everybody at home is going to start to make a game out of it. Every time she says collaboratively, let's jump up and down. Don't, don't, but, make, um, it, don't make it a drinking game. It will, not was... It'll, it will not be good for you. She said it at least 72 times. And I don't at least 72 good. times. I'm going to go for hospital. No, we don't want anybody in the hospital. If but... you are in the hospital, send your bills to Shari Smith at... <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Um, but no, I appreciate it. No, but seriously, so you work together to determine what content from that internal technical report should then be communicated in your public report, right? So you want to have the two different reports separated so that um, that way that public report goes out to everybody that completed the survey or the people that you asked to complete the survey. And that way there's an opportunity for everybody to see how the data are being used, how they're being presented. That has been a key, Travis, in helping organizations. What my clients have told me, that is what's helped them demonstrate the impact and help them increase their grant funding. Okay, That is really what they're able to do is articulate measurable and clear impact that their program has made. And that has led to being able to increase their fundraising. It's not, you know, I still stand strong. The primary reason to do program evaluation is to learn, but you can also um, increase your fundraising capacity. Yeah, it has great side effects. You know, yes, they had like really a warning does. label on it. Caution right. may increase funding if you take- Oh, this I think we should underline, in funding, I think we should underline F-U-N, increase fund. Because yeah. that's one thing people tell me. They're like, I didn't realize this is going to be so much fun. I'm like, absolutely, this is going to be fun. We're going to have a great time setting up the system and you're going to have fun like diving into the data. Yeah. You mean you're not on my show selling drudgery and dread? No. Is that what you wanted? I'm sorry. <laughs> if we could, if we could dial it down a couple notches and make this really just depressing. Really let's... talk and <laughs> let's go ahead. And then, like yeah, let's this. not do that. But... Okay. Here's here's the deal, folks. Like the people that are doing things at the highest level in whatever industry, whatever sector, they have evaluation and constant process improvement going on all the time. The people that are okay. working in factories, people that are flying from the military or fighting from the military, the people in business at the Fortune uh, 100 and 500 levels. Do you think they're they got there by not evaluating what they're doing? Let me tell you a quick story about the the foundation of Seven Up. There was a, a guy in the soft drink industry that wanted to do something, and he put out a formula, and it wasn't so great. So they retooled the formula, not so great again. In fact, he got to iteration number six of trying mm. to create something in the soft drink industry, and he ended up selling. He ended up putting it on the shelf and selling it, and someone bought it from them and they were like look it's not good but one more iteration in fact the seventh iteration they came up with seven up in the 1800s and they've used that formula ever since whatever you're going to try to do is not going to work the way you want it to the first time you're going to have to evaluate see what you are find out what you're doing what kind of impact is it having and you're going to have to adjust 
funding, you might think that funding is limited and that might be true. Can you imagine putting all your money and effort and funding into a program that just isn't working? That how isn't will working. You know, how will you know it's not working or what part of it's not working if you don't evaluate what it is that you have? That's and right. I had one more really good question for you. How is important, how important is it to, in, to have honesty in communicating your findings, whether it's to your staff or to, to funders at large? The honesty, like, tell me more about that. Like, hey, hey team, like we really suck in this area. <laughs> like l- way worse than we ever thought it was. <sighs> Like how well, important okay. is that to have those? I'm not, I'm not saying hit your staff with a two by four of, of truth. I'm not saying that, but really like open book, like, Hey, this is what we're doing well. And this is where we're not doing well. It's not anyone's fault, but like, this is what the data is showing. How important is that honesty? Oh, I think it's extremely important. And I think that I'm going to tell you a little story here that I think really highlights a lot of what we've been talking about regarding building a culture of evaluation, how you help shift from resistance to willingness and why it's so important, right? Um, Early on in my career, I made the rookie mistake of emailing a report to a client before walking through with them, which I will, I've, since then, I've never done it that way. I always, even though I think it's a great report, you know, I will still walk walk it through with them. So this report, I was a mid-year report, so two-year project. And midway through, we did some surveying and gathered data. And the report really showed all things were working really well, except for one small area. And where do you think they focused? That one small area. So (laughs) you you got it. That's right. So (laughs) they focused and they were so freaked out. They called me and said, the data are wrong we cannot share this report with our funder. You have to change it. And I thought, oh my God. (laughs) I just was like, my heart was pounding. I'm like, well, let's have a conversation about this. So I met with them the next day. And after really thinking it through and a colleague of mine, she helped me process what, you know, the conversation. And I'm like, the data aren't wrong. They just don't like the data and what it has to say. And they're afraid, you know, nonprofits, you know, they're very emotionally invested in what they're doing. And I get that. I mean, I'm a business and I'm emotionally invested in what I'm doing, but there has to be a shift from being afraid of learning what's not working to embracing it and being curious and facing that fear instead of running away from it. So when I met with them, I made it clear, you know, evaluation is not a PR or marketing activity. It is an opportunity to learn what's working and what's not. And we learned what's not working. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to write a one pager and by we, I mean you, and, but I'll talk you through it. We, We. I'm the team, you're the work teamwork, right? (laughs) That's exactly right. And here it is again. So collaboratively we brainstormed it, right? So at the top of the page was, here was the finding that everybody was saying the communications were poor. People didn't understand the purpose of the project. They didn't understand their role in the project and communications were poor. And my client was saying, we are communicating with them. We're doing emails, we're doing newsletters. And I said, well, let's dial that back. What they're saying is communications are poor. You are communicating, but it sounds like the communication methods you're using aren't effective. So let's brainstorm something else you can do that, you know, in addition to or instead of. So we talked about they could do, you know, monthly phone calls, like just open because everybody was spread out everywhere. So coming together in person wasn't feasible. So monthly phone calls, um, individual emails, and then keep create a forum where everybody can talk to each other and then create a one page statement kind of detailing out what they're doing, what everybody's role is in the process and, and really walking that through with everybody. So they bulleted those changes out and then they said, and we're gonna measure again in six months and see how it's working. So in terms of honesty, they were very nervous. Of course, they thought the data were wrong. And I said, they were, I got to talk them off the ledge. <laughs> they sent in that one page improvement plan, right? Along with the unchanged evaluation report, right? Cause the data were not wrong. And guess what? They got more funding for another project the following year. And this funder said the reason they gave them more funding was because they were so honest and transparent with what wasn't working. They weren't going to sweep it under the rug and try and hide it. 
they were very clear about this learning opportunity and how they were going to change and respond to it. So that's where I think honesty is important. And there is a fear of being honest because there is a fear of losing funding and the ramifications that come with it. And I get it. I, I mean, I don't dismiss that at all. I get that fear completely. But I'm saying that my experience has been funders respond well to organizations who are willing to show what's not working and being really honest about those results. Oh, I, I definitely love that. And we talked uh, before the show, we talked about Brene Brown a little bit. Oh, love Brene, I, Brene Brown. Just, if you're listening, love you. <laughs> just finished her book, Dare to Lead. I love audiobooks. So I'm in a truck. I listen me, to me too. stuff. <laughs> it's my not in my, I'm not in a truck, but I am, I am in my car <laughs> and I love it. Did you build it at Chevy.com? I did not. I did not build it. <laughs> Me neither. I find whatever news <laughs> thing that, that fits my purpose and yes. yeah, call it good. But you know, the, the culture of evaluation, the fear or the shame of doing something wrong. And if we don't name it, if we allow it to control us, we're never going to be able to grow and, and move forward. And that's right. All these things happen uh, to everybody. That's right. There's, there's organizations that went out, they did the 300 question survey, they collected the 500 surveys, and then they put them in a drawer somewhere and they never looked about it again. And they won't talk about it and they don't want to evaluate programs because they had a piece that was missing in their system. And now it's like a point of shame for them. Every organization right. has things like this, things that they've tried, things that haven't worked, but here's the deal. You've got to try something new. The people that didn't try something new during the pandemic, a lot of them shut their doors because mm -hmm. they were unwilling to try to do something new or continue and be adaptable. asking for funds or being adaptable. The ones that maybe had to adjust what they were doing or try something new or change their communication or meet on Zoom, those organizations are thriving and doing mm -hmm. well and understanding that everyone's going to have challenges and it's perfectly okay. But if we don't try something new, we're going to be irrelevant. We're going to close our doors. And all of a sudden, we're not providing that value or that impact that we've dedicated our lives to. That's right. And, you know, um, and, you know, with Brene Brown's work, she talks about the shame gremlins and that we all have shame gremlins. And if those shame gremlins stay quiet and they want to stay, they want you to stay quiet. They don't want you to out them because the minute you say them out loud, the minute you say, hey, the data show that something's not working, the shame gremlins get smaller and eventually disappear, but you have to be willing to deal with them and to know you're not alone in it. Like ev like you said, Travis, everybody has the shame gremlins, right? Oh my gosh, our program's not doing good enough. We're gonna lose our funding. And that all of those fears, the anxiety, oh, the shame gremlins have a freaking buffet feast on those, right? But the minute you start to have those conversations collaboratively, I had to sneak it in again, collaboratively and talk about it and be honest about it, the, the shame gremlins go away. And it, it's very empowering, you know, which is why, I mean, that's in my tagline. I empower nonprofits to use data because that's what it's about, being really willing to get honest and being willing to understand what's working and what's not. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, don't we want to make sure we are, in fact, making the difference we want to be making? And that's the way to know. Oh, I love it, Shari. And just like real gremlins, they start to dissolve if you shine a bright light on them. That's right. That's right. Shari, where can people get a hold of you and find out all the wonderful things that you do? My website, evaluationintoaction.com. There are a lot of resources on there. And, and then my book, Nonprofit Program Evaluation Made Simple, Get Your Data, Show Your Impact, Improve Your Programs is out now, available wherever books are sold. Um, if you go to my website and sign up for my newsletter, you'll get exclusive discounts for workshops that I do and tidbits and news about other events. And I don't share my list just to say that out loud. Um, but I would love it if you reached out to me. If you're curious and you're interested in doing program evaluation and you don't know how to get started, just email me at shari, C-H-A-R-I, at evaluationintoaction.com. Thanks so much, Shari. You bet. Thanks, Travis.